Hi, in this video, I want to look at why graptolites make such useful zone fossils for the lower Paleozoic, and in particular, how their evolutionary trends allow us to use these fossils for dating the rocks that we find them in. Now, graptolites are fairly enigmatic organisms. They've been extinct for a very long time. So perhaps it's worthwhile, just before we start getting into the evolutionary history of them, to remind ourselves what these organisms actually are. They're composed of a uh, type of protein, a bit like fingernail material. It's resistant to decay, and it also is resistant to being dissolved in high pressures that we find in the deep ocean, unlike calcite. They were planktonic marine organisms. They floated around in huge numbers uh, in the surface water of Paleozoic oceans. And as a result, are distributed worldwide. Because they floated around in the sea, they're not restricted to any one particular environment. They're fasces free. But we most commonly find them in the black shales that are typical of deep ocean sediment. This is where they stand the greatest chance of being preserved. The two key features we need to recognize on graptolites are the stipe, which is the, if you like, individual branches of the organism, and the theci. These are like the pockets in the side of the stipe where individual organisms would live. The best analogy I've heard is a graptolite is a, a bit like a block of flats, uh, and the theci are the balconies on those flats where people can live. Now, graptolites are useful zone fossils because they evolved rapidly through stages that we can identify quite easily. Each of these different types had a relatively short um, time span. They occurred in huge numbers. And that, as a result, perhaps more so than the robustness of the animal, the chances of fossilization are quite high, particularly in the anaerobic environments we find in the deep ocean sediments. They're very uncommon in shallow water. Um, high energy uh, environments would, would really destroy these uh, animals as fossils. We use these animals in particular to zone the Ordovician and Silurian periods. Certainly in Britain, we find a lot of deep sea sediments in these environments, or in these particular time periods, should I say, and we can use the graptolites uh, to accurately uh, date the different parts of these periods. I should as well thank the National Museum of Wales for giving me access to their um, fossil collections uh, to take the images that are used in this video. When we look at the zonation then, it's based on some evolutionary trends. Those are the changes in the number of stipes, the attitude of those stipes, the location of the theci on the stipe, and the type of theci that we see. Let me look at these four basic trends then one by one. The first of these trends is that there was a reduction in the number of stipes from lots of them in the Cambrian to just one um, towards the end of their time in the Silurian. The image you can see here, Dictonemia, is one of the earliest um, graptolites, and you can see the individual stipes shown on this particularly well-preserved example. As time progressed, the number of stipes reduces. 
This is a graptolite from the early Ordovician called Tetragraptus and has four stipes. As the Ordovician progressed, the number of stipes reduces. Dicalograptus here only has two. By the time we get to the Silurian, we have graptolites such as Monograptus, which has a, a single stipe. The second trend is a change in the attitude of the stipes. This is where the graptolites go from um, hanging downwards, what we describe as being pendant, to being reclined through horizontal, and finally to the graptolite, if you like, sticking up. Or standing up. This is what we described as being scandent. You can see that there's a small um, spike uh, on these diagrams. This is a feature, one we don't need to know, called the nema. And it's the position of this relative to the stipes that tells us whether a, um, a graptolite is pendant or scandent. The third change is a change in the arrangement of theci on the stipe. By this I mean, if we look at the theci on this uh, early Ordovician graptolite, Didymograptus, we can see that we've got theci on just one side of the stipe. This is described as being uniserial. As time progresses, we see uh, our stipes perhaps joining together. This is a sort of an intermediate form called Dicranograptus. Until eventually, we see the evolution of graptolites with theci on both sides of the stipe. We describe this as being biserial. It's worth pointing out that of the four evolutionary trends we're looking at, this is the one that perhaps has some issues with it, as some of the latest um, or most recent um, graptolites uh, from the Silurian um, were uniserial. But as a general trend, it does work most of the time. We also see the fourth change. This is a change in the shape of the theci uh, from very simple forms, such as we see on the left-hand side here, to gradually becoming more uh, elaborate, more curved. So as time progresses, as we go from left to right, we see more complex theci evolving. Until eventually you see these very uh, curved or even hooked ends to the, the theci on some graps lines. So we can summarize these changes when we look at these evolutionary trends. So from our oldest ones, that have multiple stipes, a uniserial, uh, a pendant, perhaps with simple theci. To seeing more complex theci, becoming biserial, becoming scandent, with much fewer, uh, uh, going down to a single stipe. Now, graptolites, as we can see from this um, diversity diagram, really reach their peak in the Ordovician uh, and early Silurian. 
They were incre incredibly common at that time. And combined with the rapid evolution of these identifiable features, they can make tremendous zone fossils for these two periods of geological time. So to conclude, despite the relatively fragile nature of these organisms, their abundance and their evolutionary features allow us to really quite accurately date the Ordovician and Silurian periods, in particular with the deep sea sediments that we find here in Britain. They're a very, very useful tool for dating rocks of that age. Okay, don't forget to come up with your interesting question and bring it along to class. I'll see you then.